Bueno, buenos días a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a la serie de conferencias que organiza la Real Sociedad Española de Física de Divulgación Científica, en colaboración a partir de esta, ahora, con la Fundación Ramón Areces. Quiero agradecer, por supuesto, la colaboración que siempre tenemos de todo tipo práctico y de ánimo de la, del equipo de canal de la Facultad de Físicas y de la Facultad de Matemáticas, que nos ofrece el Salón de Actos, porque como todo el mundo sabe, la Facultad de Física lleva en obras, en fin, cuando yo era jovencito y estudié aquí, se decía que eso va a tardar más que en las obras del Teatro Real. Pues aquí pasa algo por el estilo. Bueno, eh, quería insistir en que desde esta sesión las conferencias están eh, patrocinadas por la Fundación Ramón Areces y tengo aquí a mi derecha el gestor científico de la Fundación, que es el profesor José María Medina, biólogo eh, emérito de la Universidad de Salamanca, que eh, voy a ceder, vamos, voy a cederle el micrófono para que diga unas palabras en representación de la Fundación. Gracias. La, lo primero que quiero hacer es darle la bienvenida a... Eh, quiero darle la bienvenida a este ciclo de conferencias que organiza la Real Sociedad de Física. Eh, y le doy la bienvenida en nombre de la Fundación Ramón Areces, <coughs> perdón, a la que represento aquí en, hoy como sector científico que soy de ella. Probablemente todos lo conocen, pero la Fundación Ramón Areces fue establecida ahora hará 40 años por Ramón Areces, un gran empresario que después de, de crear la cadena del corte inglés decidió en el otoño de su vida ceder su fortuna a una fundación que pudiera promocionar la ciencia, y la tecnología y la cultura en general en España. Los que continuamos con estos objetivos, con esta tarea de, que nos impuso Ramón Areces, tratamos de cumplir sus objetivos a, a través de muchas iniciativas, de las que yo destacaría hoy tres. La primera, y es la inicial para la que se fundó la Fundación, fue para promocionar directamente la ciencia y de ello que cada dos años eh, hay un concurso de ayudas para la investigación. En el último concurso, para que tengan una idea, eh, se, se dedicaron unos 5,3 millones de euros a financiar directamente proyectos de investigación que siempre en, casi, en todas las convocatorias toca, digamos, de alguna manera la física, por supuesto, y va desde la, hemos financiado desde la robótica a, hasta las enfermedades raras, biomedicina, etc. El segundo, digamos, la segunda iniciativa que nosotros creemos más es la de que convocamos anualmente becas para hacer estancias postdoctorales en el extranjero. Esta, este programa, que lleva ya eh, treinta pues, y tantas convocatorias, ha conseguido eh, que muchos estudiantes de, de posgrado hayan podido trasladarse a los principales centros de, del extranjero para realizar su estancia postdoctoral. Por supuesto, está siempre... Eh, el, hay un hueco para la física y para las matemáticas, por supuesto, a, a, al lado de la química, la biomedicina, etc. Y por último, eh, la Fundación Ramón Areces quiere promocionar actividades como esta. Ramón Areces cuando fundó eh, este, esta entidad, pensó, eh, en aquel momento pensaba de que ya los científicos españoles destacaban como algo muy importante, pero que siempre tenían que esperar a ser invitados por los demás para ir a los simposios y a las reuniones. Y por eso decidió que él iba a fomentar la realización de simposios, reuniones en nuestro país, para que fuéramos nosotros los que invitáramos a los demás. Y por supuesto, la idea que tenía fundamental era la difusión de la ciencia española. Y esta es una actividad que es la que estamos haciendo hoy. Por eso cuando la sociedad de física se puso en contacto con nosotros para eh, intentar, eh, digamos, en colaborar en este aspecto de, de realizar unas conferencias en un lugar como este, en la universidad, donde fuera realmente 
sencillo y cómodo para ustedes asistir a estas conferencias, aceptamos la, su, su solicitud con, con agrado e intentamos que en el futuro podamos seguir en esta colaboración. Mm, finally, I would like to thank Professor Eli for coming for this lecture. Um, for all of you, I thank you very much from Fundación Ramón Areces. Thank you. Muchas gracias eh, al profesor Medina por acercarse hasta aquí y muy especialmente a la Fundación por el patrocinio a partir de ahora de esta serie de, de conferencias. Y ya que soy el presidente de la Real Sociedad Española de Física, pues también diré que los socios estudiantes tienen una cuota de 25 euros al año, de modo que no hay excusa para que ningún físico en esta sala no se haga socio de la Real Sociedad, en la página web es toda la información, etc. Bueno, y como la conferencia va a ser en inglés, pues eh, pasamos al inglés para la presentación de nuestro ilustre conferenciante. So, I have to say that I'm very pleased having here Professor John Ellis from uh, King's College in CERN. I know him for quite a long time, and I will not be specific on that, but I will say that he is a very good scientist, a very good particles, uh, I would say, particle phenomenologist, but with inclinations in other areas. For instance, he was uh, one of the first of uh, try in trying to join particle physics with cosmology, and even uh, with uh, supersymmetry. And in fact, I think I, I seem to remember that the hypothesis of using uh, light supersymmetric particles to take into account dark matter, which uh, is about 25% of, uh, of what we have in the universe, uh, was also, uh, also came from him. He has received uh, numerous uh, honors. I have to say that he, is, um, he has received the Dirac uh, Medal, also the Maxwell Medal. Uh, he is, of course, fellow of the Royal Society, also fellow of the IOP, the Institute of Physics, which is our brother uh, society in the United Kingdom, although there is no proportion. The IOP has more than 50,000 members, and uh, I will not say how many are we, because I expect that the number will increase once you rush coming out to, to become members of the society. I have to say that he has also another prize, which very likely he doesn't remember which is the Mayhew Prize. This is a prize which is given to the best student. This was even he uh, took his PhD in Cambridge. This is a prize, I say, that is given to uh, the first student in the uh, mathematical tripos, what now has become a uh, master in advanced uh, mathematics and physics, some, something like that. But everyone knows uh, this in Cambridge as the tripos. And I want to mention this prize because there are other illustrious physicists who have had this prize. One of them is uh, Peter Goddard, good friend of both of us. But the famous one is uh, Fred Hoyle, who was uh, an excellent uh, nuclear physicist. In fact, he was the father, I would say, of the nucleosynthesis, and also uh, well, uh, gravity person, although here he was not uh, so successful. But Anyway, he didn't get the Nobel Prize for reasons that I, I cannot uh, go into. But uh, if I wanted to mention the Mayhew Prize, is because uh, the Mayhew Prize of last year was awarded to a student, a young person who is a member of the Royal Society, who was doing the part three in Cambridge and then now is doing the doctorate, uh, the PhD in uh, UCLA. Uh, Having said that, I want to add that he, is, uh, he has been invited not only because he is an exceptional scientist, he is also an excellent speaker, and he has participated in a number of outreach activities of all kinds. I think we can consider this conference as one example of this uh, wish of uh, bringing science in general and physics in particular to young uh, audiences. Those, I like very much that most of the people in the audience are very young, but 
a few who are not so young maybe will remember uh, some preprints, uh, certain preprints. I have to say that there was a time in which uh, there were preprints. There was no internet uh, and people just would get through the mail preprints and there were first zero preprints that disappeared then CERN produced only the white uh, standard preprints and from time to time one would get a preprint which was like, uh, in fact I think it was represented like a theater play in which there were two actors facing each other and talking about physics. One was John and the other one was Alvaro de Rújula whom uh, uh, probably uh, you know, and in fact he was invited here uh, some time ago. So uh, let's just uh, uh, enjoy his talk and uh, prepare to hear what he has to say. So I'll pass the microphone to him and uh, thank him for coming. Okay. And here you have Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll use this one. I'm using the other one. It's okay. So I'd like to uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation to return to uh, Madrid, which is certainly one of my uh, favorite cities. Uh, so uh, Jose Adolfo was uh, too modest to say how long we've known each other. But according to my calculation, it's a little bit over 46 years. <laughs> I think we met a little bit over 46 years ago. <laughs> okay, so, so, so that means that the universe is uh, at least uh, 46 years old. In, in fact, of course, uh, we think from cosmological observations that the universe is actually 13.8 billion years ago. So uh, both Jose Adolfo and I are a little bit larger maybe than we used to be, uh, but of course we're, both of us, much smaller than the size of the universe today, which is something like 10 to the 28 centimeters. Of course, the universe didn't start off that size. The universe is expanding, as I will discuss in more detail. Uh, we believe that the universe started off... Whoops, what happened there? Uh, Push the wrong button. Okay. So we believe, as I said, the universe started off 13.8 billion years ago in, in a big bang. And of course, one of the things that we physicists are now trying to understand is uh, what happened in those first moments of the universe. Uh, we're not in the business of uh, answering the question, who pushed the button to start the big bang? But we do speculate about what happened after the big bang. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this talk. So this picture of the expansion of the universe obviously poses some very big questions. For example, why is the universe so big and old? I'll try to explain why this is a problem a little bit later on. Uh, the difficulty basically comes back to if you look at our fundamental equations in physics, like Einstein's equations of relativity, for example, they don't contain a big size. They don't contain a long time. We live in a very special solution of Einstein's equations, as I'll discuss in more detail later on. Now, another feature of the universe is that if you look on very, very large scales, it's almost homogeneous and isotropic. If astronomers look at the most distant objects in the universe, the distribution is more or less smooth. Of course, there's little perturbations, but more or less smooth. That's also true if you look at the microwave radiation that is the most distant light that we can see coming from very close to the beginning of the universe, as I'll be discussing later on. Now, uh, many of you struggled with Euclidean geometry at school. Think how much worse it would have been if you'd had to study Riemannian geometry at school, curved space geometry. Well, why is it that Euclidean geometry is such a good approximation? Why is the universe almost flat? That's something else that we physicists would like to explain. Now, I said that on the very large scale, the universe is approximately homogeneous and isotropic, but that's clearly not true 
on the small scale. There are lumps like Jose and myself. Okay? So, so what is the origin of these structures in the universe? So a possible answer to, to these questions, and in fact many other questions, is provided by this theory of cosmological inflation. So uh, in everyday life, uh, inflation has got a bad name for itself. But in cosmology, inflation is the way to go. At least that's the way we think the universe expanded after the Big Bang. So that's the theory that I'm going to be discussing in most of this talk. And I'll be reviewing clearly what the experimental data tell us about possible theories of inflation. And I'll say a little bit towards the end, a little bit more technical about specific models of cosmological inflation. So we know the universe is expanding. Actually, the first piece of evidence that the universe is expanding was known 100,000 years ago when people realized that the sky is dark at night. Now you may say, well, what has this got to do with the expansion of the universe? Well, suppose that the universe was in a steady state. Supposing that the universe that we see around us today had existed forever in the past. In that case, any direction that you look in, you would eventually find the surface of a star. And that would mean that the entire sky would be as bright as if you looked directly at the surface of the sun. Now people try to get around this argument by saying, well, maybe those very distant stars, the light is absorbed by dust or something, but then that dust would also emit radiation and you'd be back to the same problem, which is known as Olber's paradox. He was the first guy who pointed out that this was a problem for a steady state theory of cosmology. So this is the first hint that the universe is not in a steady state and is evolving in some way. Now the first concrete evidence for this expansion, as I think probably most people know, was provided by Edwin Hubble. So he looked at uh, distant galaxies, which were a relatively new discovery back in the 1920s, and he found that the light coming from those galaxies became redder the further away they were, the famous redshift. This effect grows with distance, and we understand this as due to the expansion of light waves as the universe itself expands. The fabric of space is expanding, and with that, light waves propagating through that space. Nowadays, we can see a lot further than what uh, Hubble saw back in the 1920s. The most distant galaxies that we can see are something like 10 billion light years ago, light years away. And we see them as they were 10 billion years ago. And one of the truly amazing things about astrophysics and cosmology is that exactly the same laws of physics apply to those very old and very distant objects as apply here in the laboratory. So Edwin Hubble was a student at the University of Chicago, and he was not famous for winning the Mayhew Prize. He was famous for being a basketball player. And uh, you see here on the uh, right of the, uh, on the left of the picture, I can't get this thing to work. Okay, you can see where uh, Hubble is on the side of that picture. So, of course, uh, amongst physicists, astrophysicists and cosmologists, he's much more famous for having discovered the expansion of the universe. And uh, here is uh, Hubble's original graphical plot. Now, if one of you students gave me this plot in a class exercise, I would give you zero marks. Okay? I would give you zero marks because there are no error bars. Every measurement has uncertainties. And also, the vertical axis was wrong. He's got the velocity in kilometers. And as you can see, somebody is in added in red kilometers per second. So uh, there's problems with this plot, but the answer, uh, I did it again. The answer is right. Light from distant stars, distant galaxies is redshifted, and that effect grows with distance. And of course, as you know, there was this famous astronomical satellite called Hubble which provided some of the most detailed observations of this effect. This is the region where Hubble data were taken. 
and this is how the effect grows as you go to increasing distance. So the universe is undoubtedly expanding. Now there's a couple of other important pieces of evidence for this expansion of the universe. And one is provided by the cosmic microwave background. And that is evidence that the universe was once 3,000 times smaller and 3,000 times hotter than it is today. So this was discovered in 1963 by Penzias and Wilson, uh, who look in this picture a little bit like a couple of uh, Chicago gangsters. Well, I can tell you they're not Chicago gangsters. They live in New Jersey. <laughs> so behind them, you see the antenna which they used to make this discovery, which was actually uh, set up to look at some of the first telecommunication satellites. And what they found was a mysterious radiation coming from everywhere in space, uh, microwave radiation, which was almost the same in all directions. Uh, subsequent observations have shown that this radiation is not quite uniform. It actually has small fluctuations, which are shown here in false colors. And uh, that was discovered by John Mather and George Smoot using the COBE satellite uh, for which they got the Nobel Prize in 2006. So just a little historical aside about this cosmic microwave radiation. When it was first discovered, it was completely unexpected, and they looked for all sorts of more conventional effects that could explain what it was, what it was due to. And one of the things that they noticed was that there were pigeons nesting in their antenna. And so they thought that this signal might do be due to guano. So they had a big effort to uh, trap and remove those, penguin, th those pigeons. Uh, the historical record is not clear whether the pigeons actually survived or whether they were shot. But anyway, they were removed. But the signal was not removed. The signal stayed there. And uh, if any of you still have one of those old-fashioned TVs where you get that you no know, speckle on the screen, you know, some fraction of that speckle on the screen is actually that microwave radiation from about 13 billion years ago. So this radiation, uh, as I mentioned, it's very uniform. It looks very much like a black body radiation with a temperature of something like 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. As I said, it's almost the same in all directions, not quite, because uh, the sun and the earth are moving relative to this radiation with a speed of about 700 kilometers per second. Now, even after you take out that effect, there are very small fluctuations in this radiation, at a level of about one in 100,000. And those very small fluctuations are going to play a big role in the story that I'm going to be talking about today. Those fluctuations could have originated from this cosmological inflation in the very early universe. And we believe that those fluctuations are responsible for all the structures that we see in the universe today. Okay, so that was the second piece of evidence for the expansion, the cosmic microwave background. There's another piece of evidence that the universe was once one billion times smaller and hotter than it is today. And that's provided by the abundances of light elements, which we think originated in the Big Bang. So in your introduction, you mentioned Fred Hoyle. He's the father of nuclear astrophysics. But nuclear astrophysics does not explain the origin, for example, of the helium in the universe. There's something like 24% by weight of helium amongst the uh, visible matter in the universe, and smaller amounts of deuterium, lithium, and so on. And those were manufactured by nuclear reactions in the very early universe, when the whole universe was basically a nuclear fusion reactor, uh, something like one billion times smaller and hotter than it is today. Now, the calculations of the abundances of those light elements depend on the amount of matter in the universe. And what those measurements tell us is that there's not enough conventional matter to stop the expansion of the universe, or indeed to make the galaxies that we see around us. There has to be some additional form of matter, not conventional nuclear matter. Mm. 
And the abundances of these light elements also depend on the number of types of elementary particles, which is one of the connections between particle physics and cosmology that we'll be coming back to later on. So uh, this graph is a little bit more technical. It shows you the abundances of uh, helium and uh, lithium. Uh, it shows you as straight lines the theoretical calculations. Uh, the boxes represent the uncertainties in the measurements. Uh, the uh, theoretical predictions cross those boxes, so there's agreement between experiment and theory. And that consistency tells us how much matter, conventional matter, there is in the universe. And that's represented by this red arrow here. If you wanted to, exp to stop the expansion of the universe, I'm not quite sure why you would want to stop the expansion of the universe, but if you want to stop the expansion of the universe, you would need this amount of matter. Okay, so here's a little uh, picture which shows uh, some of the key points in the evolution of the universe. So that microwave radiation was emitted something like 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And that radiation was actually the birth cries of atoms. When the universe was less than 300,000 years ago, there was no atoms, no chemistry, no biology. Only physics. If you go back when the universe was less than three minutes old, there were none of those light nuclei I've just been talking about. Those light nuclei are made up out of protons and neutrons. But if you go back when the universe was less than a microsecond old, there were no protons or neutrons either. There were just their constituent particles called quarks and gluons. And if you go back when the universe was less than a picosecond old, that's a millionth of a millionth of a second old, we think that nothing had any mass. Even the Higgs particle no, had no effect that early in the history of the universe. And of course, before then, there was a Big Bang. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about dark matter later on. That is another form of matter which we believe uh, disconnected from conventional matter when the universe was somewhere between one picosecond and one microsecond old. And of course, you might also ask, what's the origin of matter? And that is something which we believe occurred when the universe was at most one picosecond old. Maybe at the same time that the Higgs mechanism switched on and gave masses to the elementary particles. So all these issues, of course, are issues that we are exploring now with experiments of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. OK, so let, let's go back then to the very early universe. Very young, very small, very high temperature. The constituents of the universe had very high temperatures. Just to give you an order of magnitude, when the universe was about one second old, its temperature was about 10 billion degrees, and a typical particle energy would be similar to that of the mass of the electron. This means that if you want to discuss the very early history of the universe, sorry guys, you're going to have to use particle physics. Now I'd like to say a little bit more about the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, and that will lead us more into details of theories about cosmological inflation. So in the top part of this picture, I've got uh, the image of the microwave background radiation from COBE. And in false color, you see those fluctuations in the intensity in different directions. Subsequently, more detailed observations were made. For example, the WMAP satellite was able to observe structures in this radiation on a much smaller scale with higher precision. But the real record holder in terms of observations of the cosmic microwave background radiation comes from the Planck satellite. Uh, this is the most precise image that we have of that primordial radiation. Now, this is the set of observations which we use to constrain our imaginations about theories of cosmological inflation. This is perhaps telling us that when the universe was very young, there was something very much like the Higgs boson. Perhaps even the Higgs boson itself generated these fluctuations. Or maybe some more complicated theory based on ideas such as supersymmetry, which I'll mention a little bit later on. Now, of course, when you look at that picture, uh, you don't see very much. 
But if you analyze it more carefully, then that picture tells a story. And I like to think of it as being in some sense a sort of pointillist image of the very early universe. If you look at the structure, you'll see there was a characteristic size of those little points here, a little bit like the dabs of paint that the Prantilists put on their canvas. Now, the Planck satellite produced its data a few years ago. More recently, uh, you've probably heard about data from the BICEP experiment. There's a lot of excitement. The BICEP experiment looked at the polarization of that microwave background radiation, and it found structures which resembled those that you might get if there was quantum gravitational radiation in the sky. And this is why there was such tremendous excitement a couple of years ago. So uh, if you want an artistic analog, uh, here is a, a vorticist picture, which uh, maybe reminds you of uh, bicep. Unfortunately, uh, it turns out that those bicep observations are probably just due to dust, polarized dust in the neighborhood of our galaxy, and they're not primordial. So that original bicep claim to observe quantum gravitational radiation has uh, unfortunately crumbled into dust. But you know, we look forward to future data on gravitational waves and gravitational radiation, perhaps coming quite soon. OK, so let's go back to the data from Planck. I said that uh, those little dots on the picture uh, tell a story, and this is the story that they tell. So here, the vertical axis is the intensity of those fluctuations in the microwave background radiation. And the horizontal axis is the angular size in the sky. And you see here, there's a big peak in the intensity corresponding to fluctuations of about one degree in angle. And that actually corresponds, if you go think back to that Prantilist picture, of the dominant size of those spots. Okay, they're about one degree in size. But they're spots on all sorts of different sizes. So I won't go through the mathematics of it, but the angular size of that peak there tells us what is the total density of stuff in the universe. And it tells us that that density is very cr close to the critical density which would correspond to an exactly flat universe. The other structures tell us about the density of matter in the universe. In particular, it tells us, in addition to the conventional matter, the nuclei that I was talking about earlier on, there's also additional dark matter. And dark matter plays an important part in the story, so I'll be saying a bit more about that. So Hubble made his observations back in the 1920s. In the 1930s, Swiss physicist Fritz Zwicky came along, and he said that there must be this dark stuff generating additional gravitational field over and above the gravitational field generated by the visible matter in the universe. And this first evidence came from observing clusters of galaxies and seeing that those galaxies were moving around in those clusters faster than you would have expected. Now, people were not initially convinced by Mr. Zwicky, but you had to be very careful arguing with him. He was quite a tough personality, as you can imagine from this picture. Now, later on, uh, observations indicated that this dark matter exists not just at the level of clusters of galaxies, but also at levels of individual galaxies. So here's a typical galaxy, much like our own. The stars are swirling around like in a whirlpool, and they're going quite fast. If the only gravitational field was that generated by the stars themselves, then by rights, those stars should fly away. But they don't. They're held together by dark matter, maybe, as I'll discuss later, something to do with supersymmetry. Now, the best evidence for this came from very detailed observations by Vera Rubin, whom you see here in the 1970s and the 1980s. And I think that she really, uh, really deserves the lion's share of the credit for convincing people to take this dark matter hypothesis seriously. 
So uh, this is a, a picture of the sorts of observations that she and her colleagues made. So if you look in the solar system, you know that the speeds with which planets orbit the sun decreases with distance. Now here we are, Pluto in this is still a planet, but it's still going very slowly. And that's because the mass of the solar system is concentrated in the middle in the sun. But if you look at a typical galaxy, that's not the case at all. The speeds remain roughly constant out to very large distances. And that tells you that there is some distribution of matter much larger than the observable light that you saw on the previous slides. And that, we believe, is this dark matter. So I have a very sophisticated graphic which demonstrates this. Okay. If it wasn't for the dark matter, I want to see it again. If it wasn't for the dark matter, that galaxy would fly apart by centrifugal force. Now, there's many other pieces of evidence for dark matter. Let me just mention uh, two or three. Uh, for example, people observe uh, clouds of hot X-ray emitting gas. If you've got a hot gas, it's got pressure. It's trying to push itself apart, but it's hanging together. Why is it hanging together? Because it is sitting in a cloud of dark matter. And people have even seen evidence from gravitational lensing of so-called dark galaxies without any stars in them. I, I talked about gravitational lensing. Here's a, a picture which I think is very nice. So you look at very distant objects. The light coming towards us is bent by matter in the intervening space. So some of that is visible galaxies. But you see that in addition to the visible galaxies, there's this little big mound of matter which is not associated with individual galaxies. And that big cloud of additional matter is dark, dark matter. And perhaps the most celebrated evidence for dark matter comes from uh, this observation of the collision of two galactic clusters so these contours here represent the lensing effect of dark matter. And in between here, you see these clouds. Those are hot clouds of gas. And the interpretation is that when those two clusters collided, the stars and the dark matter went through, but the gas stayed behind. So when we talk about dark matter, it can't be gas. It has to be something different some type of object that interacts very weakly. So if you put all these observations together, the microwave background radiation, called here the CMB, as I told you, that tells us that the total density of stuff in the universe is close to flat. Okay? But then from observations of uh, supernovae, structures, and so on, we can infer what the density of matter is, and that's given by this green line here. The vertical axis is the density of energy in empty space, the so-called dark energy. So the horizontal axis is dark mass, it is matter, the vertical axis is dark energy, and observations of the microwave background radiation and all the structures in the universe tell us that we're sitting there. So there is certainly dark matter, and in fact that dark matter is somewhere between 25 and 30% of the total density of the universe. The stuff that we are made of, the baryons, the nuclei, the atoms, that's only a, a few percent. And in fact most of the universe is tied up in this dark energy and empty space. And that dark energy and empty space is also closely related to what we think drove the exponential inflationary expansion of the universe when it was very young. So let's come now to look at cosmological inflation and see how it can explain all these observations. So we're asking ourselves the question, why is the universe so big? Why is it approximately homogeneous on very large scales? Why is geometry approximately flat? What is the origin of structures in the universe? The hypothesis is that 
very early in the history of the universe, it expanded extremely rapidly, nearly exponentially, and that exponential expansion was pushed by energy in empty space, much like the Higgs field, but also much like the dark energy there is today. The dark energy that we see today may in fact be in some sense a reincarnation of that primordial inflationary expansion. And the structures, the galaxies, the clusters of galaxies, Jose. We all would originate from quantum fluctuations during that primordial expansion early in the history of the universe. We are all quantum. So let me say a little bit more about this puzzle about the size and age of the universe. So I said in my introduction that obviously the expansion of the universe is controlled by Einstein's equations. So here they are, uh, 101 years old. Okay? And so we've got the curvature of space on the left-hand side represented by R. We've got the matter represented by T on the right-hand side. And there's this constant G that comes in. That G is Newton's constant, and it has the dimensions of energy, an energy of 10 to 19 GV. You could represent that also as an effective distance, which is 10 to the minus 32 centimeters, or an effective time scale, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Very small distances, very small times. But if you solve that equation, a generic solution would have a size of 10 to the minus 32 centimetres and would live for 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Our universe has to be an incredibly special solution of Einstein's equations. And the hypothesis is that it was that other quantity, lambda, on the left-hand side, which represents energy in empty space, that that so-called cosmological constant drove the expansion of the universe, that that cosmological expansion is due to some sort of scalar field, maybe something like the Higgs field. So a little parenthesis. Uh, Einstein originally wrote the equations without lambda. At that time, the expansion of the universe was not known. It was thought the universe was uh, in a more, more or less steady state. And he realized that if he just put in matter, he could not get a steady state universe. So he thought, ah, but I can add in that lambda. So he added in the lambda, and then he found a steady state universe. And he was very happy, but not for very long, because then people pointed out that that universe was unstable. And so Einstein subsequently regarded the introduction of lambda as being his greatest mistake. Nowadays, I think we regard it as being one of his greatest strokes of genius. And that his mistake may be responsible for the size and age of the universe today. So if the expansion of the universe is driven by that lambda term, then it expands exponentially. So that's illustrated here. This is uh, this overall size of the universe on the vertical axis. That exponential expansion would have caused the universe to expand incredibly quickly for some period of time. Eventually, that exponential expansion would have terminated. But what it means is that all the visible universe was once extremely small. So I mentioned earlier on the most distant galaxies are something like 10 billion light years away. And in conventional cosmology, if you imagine where they were relative to us in the past, they were so far away that not only could we never have seen them, but there would have been no way for uh, we to coordinate what's happening in our part of the universe with what's happening in that part of the universe. If you like, distant parts of the universe on opposite sides of the microwave background radiation would have had no way of behaving identically. We could not expand, uh, understand the approximate homogeneity and isotropy of the universe. But with this period of exponential expansion, all the visible stuff in the universe, and probably a lot more, started off very close together, and it would have been possible for 
all the distant parts of the universe to synchronize their watches, expand, and then when we look at them today, they're approximately the same. Also, this rapid period of exponential expansion could explain why the geometry of the universe is almost flat. So here's a, a little picture which is supposed to illustrate this idea of uh, cosmological inflation. So the idea is that uh, all the visible universe and a lot more besides started off in a very small volume. This exponential expansion expanded that volume enormously so that all the stuff that we see in the universe to today was once all very, very close together. Now, if you want to understand the flatness of the universe, think about a child's party balloon. So you start off with a sort of crumpled piece of rubber. You pump it up with air. And the surface becomes flatter and flatter. So the geometry becomes almost flat. If you were an ant on the surface of a kid's balloon, you can't see very far, and you would think that the surface of the balloon is flat, or very nearly flat. And so that's the idea here, that the exponential expansion of the universe caused the geometry to be almost flat. That's not the end of the story. I've talked about the fluctuations in the microwave background radiation, and those fluctuations, we believe, are responsible for the structures in the universe, and we believe that those structures originated from quantum effects in this very early universe. So, a little bit more about this idea. So we have this idea that we had this uh, energy in empty space, cosmological constant, lambda, but we think that that lambda is due to some field, maybe something like the Higgs field, maybe in fact the Higgs field. But as soon as you say field, then you have to make a quantum theory of that field. That field phi would have had quantum fluctuations. And those would cause perturbations in the energy density, which is what we think we've seen uh, with the Planck and other satellites. But also fluctuations in the gravitational field, so-called metric or tensor perturbations. And that's the type of perturbation that BICEP thought, we saw, thought they saw but now we don't think they did, but we're still looking for Now, because this expansion is uh, exponential, goes on for a long time, these fluctuations would be almost independent of scale size. And that's actually what's strongly suggested by those data from the Planck satellite. So I have another extremely sophisticated graphic which uh, illustrates all this. So uh, here we have the field representing the situation in the very early universe. It was subject to quantum fluctuations. Eventually, this inflationary period where you had energy in empty space ended, and we roll down to the bottom of this effective potential, to the minimum energy state, which is where we are today. Now, because of these primordial quantum fluctuations, the subsequent history of the universe reflects those quantum effects. And that's what gives us, we think, those fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. So here on the left, I've got those fluctuations in the microwave background that you've seen before, those little speckles, those little pantelist uh, images. Now, what you can do then is you can trace the evolution subsequent to the cosmic microwave background radiation. And mind you, that cosmic microwave, those, those fluctuations represent fluctuations in the local density of the universe. If you have dark matter, then dark matter falls into the more dense regions. It moves away from the less dense regions that magnifies those density fluctuations, and that's what can give rise to structures. Uh, and this has been the subject of very detailed simulations that I'm not going to go through in this talk. 
So here again is my super sophisticated animation of the perturbations becoming density fluctuations. Now I have an even more sophisticated graphic showing how this gave rise to the structures in the universe. So because of those primordial perturbations, you had some regions where the energy was lower, some where it was higher, hills and valleys in the effective energy. If I put in dark matter, represented here by these little red dots, and I follow the evolution, it's going to fall down into those potential holes. And that's how we believe the structures in the universe were formed. Primordial fluctuations due to quantum effects magnified by dark matter. So I said I'm not going to show you any details, but I can't resist showing this picture here, which is an observation of structures in the universe on many different scales. Uh, they go here up at the top in megaparsecs, from one megaparsec to 10,000 megaparsecs. And the black line is the prediction based on cosmological inflation and dark matter. And the observations, as you can see, are in perfect agreement. So this is a, a really, I think, convincing theory of where the structures in the universe came from. Quantum effects and dark matter. So now I want to go a little bit in more detail in uh, where we are in uh, testing and constructing models of cosmological inflation. So we have this idea that we have this uh, energy in empty space, lambda, which is associated with some field phi. Uh, the magnitude of those density perturbations tells us how much energy density there had to be during that exponential expansion. And it's, it's fairly small. Okay. Now, in order for that exponential expansion to continue for a long period of time, the density had to remain almost constant. It could change a little bit. In fact, we expect it to vary a little bit because eventually we're going to roll down the hill into the bottom. But that rolling has to be slow. And so people, when they formulate theories of cosmological inflation, consider what are so-called slow row models where the slope of the potential is small and where also the second derivative is small so that we can get a large number of e-folds of expansion. Now the main observables that we can use to check these ideas are associated with the scalar density perturbations and if we ever get to see them, those tensor gravitational perturbations. So the scalar perturbations, they're almost scale invariant, but not quite. There's a small tilt in the spectrum. And we can also hope to measure the ratio of the tensor gravitational perturbations to the scalar ones. So this is... Uh, a picture of the uh, inflationary landscape which is indicated by data from the Planck satellite and other data including in particular BICEP. So here on the horizontal axis we've got the tilt. One here that would correspond to a scale invariant spectrum that would correspond to a primordial energy density which was absolutely constant but nobody believes that. Everybody believes the energy density must go down. We expect to see a tilt, and there is a tilt. Okay. The vertical axis, that is the ratio of these tensor gravitational perturbations to the scalar density perturbations. And that ratio is small. Okay. It's uh, less than about 0.1. Now, the BICEP satellite, the BICEP experiment, thought that they had observed tensor perturbations, gravitational effects up here somewhere. But as I mentioned earlier, that observation, that interpretation of their observations has been discredited. So the data want you to be in this region down here. A tilt and a small tensor to scalar ratio. 
Now, the various different colored dots and wiggles and lines and so on there correspond to different theories of inflation. So there's, I know, thousands of papers written about models of inflation who all try to explain these data down here. So for example, the simplest thing that you might think of is that, that uh, potential V of phi is just a simple power law, like uh, maybe phi cubed. Doesn't work. Too much gravitational perturbations. Phi squared, that doesn't work either. Phi, well, you know, you're getting closer, but you're not really in the favored region. Phi to the two thirds? Well, I know, now you're getting close, but, 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 but where, what model predicts something like that? So the simplest models of cosmological inflation don't work very well. However, there's another model down here. And that is a model which was uh, proposed actually back in 1980 by the Russian physicist Starobinsky. And in fact, his theory had an entirely different starting point. He didn't put in a scalar field, ab initio. He just said, well, maybe there's an extra term in Einstein's equations. Einstein's equations has R, which I showed a few slides back. Starobinsky said maybe there's R squared. And if you do that appropriately, then you can also get something that looks like inflation. And as you can see, his model of inflation looks like it's right in the money. It certainly seems highly consistent with the present data. So you know, a lot of what we who are trying to construct models of inflation are now doing is trying to find models which somehow explain Starobinsky or give a context in which you can understand Starobinsky's model. So to summarize, as I said, those data pose challenges for many simple inflationary models. The very simplest models that many people are writing down don't work. Starobinsky, postulated back in 1980, that seems to work quite well. But there are other models that do essentially equally well. For example, some people have proposed models in which inflation is actually driven not by some scalar field like the Higgs boson, but actually by the Higgs boson itself. I think those ideas don't work, but you know, it's worth thinking about. Actually, there's another class of models which uh, I personally am working on, which I find more promising, which uh, involve the S word that I mentioned on a couple of occasions, namely supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is this Know, speculated extrapolation of the standard model. You get a whole bunch of extra particles. Some of those particles could be the dark matter. And if that's the right way, then the very early universe must have been approximately supersymmetric. And that may provide a context in which you can understand Sarabinsky's model. So, so this is a, a variant of the previous plot which is uh, taken from uh, a master's thesis uh, written by uh, one of my students at King's, uh, Samsara Teparia, and it's an extension of early work, early work that we did with another master's student, uh, Juno Kroon, and uh, my colleague at King's, Nick Mavromatos. So th this sort of blue region here, this is the same thing that you've seen before. This is what the data seem to be telling us. And, and here's the Starobinsky model down here. And uh, what we were able to do was construct models which don't exactly get down to Starobinsky, but at least uh, you know, fairly close to Starobinsky and certainly compatible with the data. So there the are other people who construct models as well. Uh, this is an extremely uh, active area at the moment. And I think we can expect uh, big advances in studies of the microwave background radiation and probes of cosmological inflation in the years to come. So I just wanted to close with a sort of slightly more philosophical remark. So, so let's 
review our understanding of cosmology. Well, we don't think that the Earth is on the back of a turtle that's on the back of another turtle that's on the back of another turtle. Once upon a time, though, we thought that the Earth was the centre of the solar system. But Copernicus told us that's not the case. So we realised that we were going around the sun, uh, but for a long time people did not understand the structure of the galaxy. Now we know that in fact our sun is just one of a uh, hundred billion stars uh, orbiting uh, a galaxy. Uh, we're not even particularly close to the middle of the galaxy, actually we're in sort of one of the outer suburbs of the galaxy. Just as well, probably life would be impossible in the middle. It was discovered at the beginning of the 20th century that our galaxy is just one of a hundred billion galaxies. And of course uh, Hubble discovered that those universe, that those uh, galaxies were expanding away from each other. That was one of the evidences for the expansion of the universe that we're talking about. Then Zwicky and Vera Rubin convinced us that actually not only we're we not at the centre of the universe, we're not even made of the same type of matter as most of the matter in the universe. Most of the matter in the universe is not conventional atoms. Most of the matter in the universe is dark matter. But not only that, most of the density of energy in the universe is not in the form of matter at all. Most of the energy density in the universe is in empty space, in between the galaxies, in between the clusters of galaxies. And it's that invisible dark energy which is now causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And it's some very similar form of dark energy that we believe drove this cosmological inflation when the universe was very young. Dark energy may have blown the universe up when it was 10 to the minus 35 seconds old. And that explosion may be responsible through quantum effects for the structures that we see in the universe today. Thank you. de la inflación eh, dicen que podría ser la, la causa de que hubiera más de un universo ¿qué piensa usted? pues como dije uh, la expansión de la inflación cosmológica la, la, la inflación podría uh, generar un universo mucho más grande que el, el universo que, que vemos mucho más grande que uh, esa distancia de uh, 10 uh, mil millones de años de luz que, uh, que vemos directamente con los telescopios. Y es posible que en otras partes del universo, más fuera del, del horizonte que, que podemos ver, que las leyes de la física son diferentes. Comenté que las leyes de la física en estas estrellas a una distancia de 10 mil millones de años de luz, que las mismas leyes de, de física aplican allí. Pero no sabemos si las mismas leyes de física aplican en otras partes del universo que, que no podemos ver. Pues, según varias teorías de la inflación, efectivamente las leyes ahí serían diferentes. Pero el problema para mí es cómo saber que hay esta diferencia. Cómo uh, encontrar evidencia de este multiverso. Este es el problema filosófico para mí. El, el modelo estándar es el modelo que explica cómo es la materia convencional. ¿Hay un modelo de campos de la materia oscura? Sí, claro que sí. 
pues, uh, por ejemplo, comenté uh, uh, la teoría de la, de la supersimetría que, que me gusta mucho. Uh, según esta, esta teoría, es una teoría de campos, exactamente como el modelo estándar. En el modelo estándar hay partículas de materia, como electrones, hay partículas de, de, de fuerza, como el fotón. Y la supersimetría da una simetría entre estas partículas de materia y de interacción. Uh, los fermiones y los bosones. Y es una teoría de los campos, exactamente como los otros, uh, también mejor, porque tiene menos uh, divergencias en los cálculos, es más fácil hacer cálculos uh, sencillos. Pues uh, hay varias teorías de la materia oscura basadas en la supersimetría. Y, uh, uno de, de, de mis intereses personales en uh, la investigación es justamente comprobar estas teorías supersimétricas. Hola, gracias por la exposición. La comprobación de estas teorías supersimétricas es puramente teórica, ¿no? Porque de forma experimental es imposible detectar, a no ser que sea mediante observaciones, quiero decir, en la Tierra... En un laboratorio no se puede operar con algo que simplemente no, no podemos... Pues hay, hay varios modos de uh, estudiar la materia oscura experimentalmente. Una posibilidad es que en varias teorías de la materia oscura, las, la materia oscura está compuesta de partículas, partículas que pesan menos de uh, mil veces la masa del protón. Entonces, partículas que podríamos uh, fabricar con el LHC, por ejemplo. Y los experimentos del LHC están buscando uh, evidencias indirectas para la producción de estas partículas de materia oscura. Hay otros modos más directos, pero no con aceleradores. Por ejemplo, uh, estudiar, uh, uh, buscar impactos de partículas de materia oscura en materia nuclear en laboratorios subterráneos. Por ejemplo, aquí en España hay un laboratorio donde hacen ese, ese tipo de experimento. O, otra posibilidad es buscar evidencias para la aniquilación de partículas de uh, materia oscura, uh, que tal vez podrían dar señales en uh, varios gamas, por ejemplo. Y hay varios experimentos buscando eso. Ah, otro experimento. Sí. <risa> oh, no. Rápido, rápido. <risa> Él es uno de los jefes del experimento espacial AMS en la estación espacial que justamente está buscando evidencias de las aniquilaciones de las partículas de materia oscura. Gracias. No, pero en relación... ¿Tienes noticias para nosotros? No. 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 <risa> en relación con esto, yo creo que los últimos resultados del Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation de Hubble ¿eh? dicen que ese proceso de aniquilación de partículas de materia oscura, que es lo que daría lugar a exceso de positrones o de antipositrones, que eso, sus medidas excluyen que estos procesos existan. Por, claro que los datos... Uh Tú quieres decir tal vez la, la, los datos de Planck sobre la, uh, el fondo de, de radiación microonda. Pues dan límites superiores sobre uh, la producción de varios gas, gamas y otras partículas por estas aniquilaciones. Pero esto no excluye la hipótesis, porque hay modelos donde uh, las, uh, las aniquilaciones son menos que en, en los en las teorías excluidas por las observaciones de Planck. Hay que, que seguir con estas medidas para dar límites, para tener más sensibilidad. Y la otra pregunta que está en relación con lo que tú conoces muy bien de las búsquedas en el LHC. De momento, en la fase RAN 1, el LHC no ha encontrado ninguna señal de partícula que sea compatible con partículas supersimétricas. Todos esos límites se van a mejorar en los próximos dos o tres años, con los datos a 13 o 14 teraelectronvoltios. Si con esos datos tampoco hay evidencia experimental 
de partículas compatibles con partículas supersimétricas, quiere decir que deberíamos de empezar a olvidarnos de que la supersimetría ¿eh? es realmente la teoría que va a mejorar el actual modelo estándar o podemos seguir diciendo no, pues si no se han encontrado a 10 terelectronvoltios, puede ser que sean partículas a 100, a 1000 terelectronvoltios. ¿Hay algún límite para seguir hablando de partículas supersimétricas independientemente de lo que los experimentos digan? Sí. Pues hay un dicho ruso que dice, no uh, puedes vender el piel del oso antes de matarlo. Yo diría que no se puede no vender el no piel del no eso sin no no matarlo. Pues hay que esperar un rato para ver que nos muestra el HC RAN2. Con el RAN1 um, excluimos en modelos uh, uh, sencillos de la supersimetría masas, por ejemplo, de la partícula gluino hasta 1500 GeV. Con los futuros runners podríamos extender esta búsqueda hasta 3000 GeV. Vamos a ver qué pasa. Vamos a ver. Pero la, la, la cosa fundamental es que con el IHC, con energía mucho más alta que antes, vamos a explorar mucho más adelante que, que, que antes. Claro que sí. Eh, según has explicado, el, la inflación eh, resuelve el problema de, del horizonte y el problema de la planitud. ¿no? Eh, introduce además, eh, con los efectos cuánticos, las semillas de las que aparecen las galaxias, etc. ¿no? Antes de que apareciese el modelo de inflación, eh, se suponía que esas semillas de galaxias, de toda la materia en definitiva, eh, provenían de, de fluctuaciones cuánticas en el propio Big Bang, sin todavía la inflación. ¿En qué medida mejora las fluctuaciones cuánticas o en qué diferencia las fluctuaciones cuánticas del modelo de inflación las, las originales? O, o qué, qué, ¿Qué relación hay entre ellas? Pues, uh, como comenté ante, uh, al inicio, porque nosotros físicos no tratamos de explicar el origen del universo, sino la expansión después del Big Bang. Y uh, durante la inflación el universo pierde memoria de qué había antes de, del periodo de, de inflación. Tal vez, tal vez no. Hay una posibilidad que había una pequeña memoria del estado antes de la inflación en uh, las fluctuaciones con uh, tamaño muy, muy grande. Y uh, hay algunas anomalías en las observaciones de Planck, por ejemplo, que se puede explicar con un estado preinflacionario. En mi opinión, este es muy uh, especulativo y, y no pongo muchísimo atención. Pero hay que, hay que aceptar que hay esa posibilidad. Pero normalmente lo que pasa es que durante la inflación la memoria se va. Tienes que esperar un rato. Ok. Uh, el, uh, refiere a las presentaciones que hicieron los experimentos Atlas y CMS del LHC el 15 de diciembre. Y los dos experimentos estaban siguiendo con las mismas observaciones que, uh, con que descubrieron el bosón de Higgs. Y uh, encontraron tal vez evidencias muy, muy débiles ¿no? de tal vez un señal tal vez un similar al bosón de Higgs. Pero, como dice con una masa de 750 G. Pues probablemente este, estos señales, entre comillas, 
son uh, fluctuaciones estadísticas. Okay. Y uh, los, uh, los experimentales no quieren hablar de nueva partícula. Pero nosotros teóricos uh, podemos soñar, ¿no? <risa> y no, no solamente soñar, pero escribir artículos. Y uh, hay un tsunami de interpretaciones de estos datos. Uh, más de uh, 150 uh, trabajos, uh, yo escribí solamente dos. Claro que si hay una nueva partícula, sería una partícula más allá del modelo estándar. Y uh, no solamente una partícula, la partícula descubierta, pero también otras partículas para explicar su producción y su desintegración. Pues, abriría una nueva época en la física de partículas. Sería una revolución en, en la física fundamental. Sería, tal vez, demasiado que esperar. Pues, hay que ver qué pasa con la continuación del RAN2. Claro que hay uh, propuestas de conexiones entre la existencia de esta partícula con la materia oscura, con la inflación, con uh, el futuro del universo. Hay toda clase de especulación, pero hay que esperar los resultados experimentales. Y soñar. Hasta hace poco tiempo algunos teóricos han especulado sobre la posibilidad que el campo del inflatón eh, sea la partícula de Higgs del modelo estándar. ¿Tienes algún comentario que hacer al respecto? Pues, como comenté antes, no me parece muy probable. El problema es uh, la masa medida del, uh, del bosón de Higgs y la masa medida del quark top. Pues lo que pasa es que para hacer una teoría de inflación hay que extrapolar muchísimo en la energía. Se puede hacer en el modelo estándar, pero entonces encontramos que el potencial del campo de Higgs vuelve negativo. Y, y claro, para empujar la expansión del universo necesitamos un potencial positivo. Okay. Pues, en mi opinión, hay que extender el modelo uh, estándar para evitar esta, este hueco en el potencial. Por ejemplo, la supersimetría. Uh, y sin la supersimetría no se puede hacer la inflación con el bosón de X, pero con la supersimetría sí. Y, y escribí un artículo sobre ese. <risa> ¿Alguna pregunta más? La última. La penúltima. <risa> Mira, yo quería hacer una, una pregunta que eh, no tanto técnica, sino no sé si siquiera si es filosófica. Un científico como, como, como usted, eh, ¿cómo sabe dónde poner la línea de especulación científica y hocus pocus? <risa> eh, eh, metodológicamente hablando, o sea, ¿hasta dónde puede llegar mi especulación? y mantener esta especulación como una especulación científica? Pues, <risa> esta es una, una, una discusión muy grande en la filosofía de, de la ciencia. Y uh, mi estilo de, de hacer la física es uh, permanecer cerca del experimento. Y me acuerdo que uh, cuando yo empezaba como estudiante, mi profesor me pregunté, ¿quieres hacer... Uh, uh, física o matemática o física fenomenológica. Yo dije fenomenológica. Okay. Esa fue mi, uh, mi, uh, mi ambición. Pero claro que hay otros modos de hacer la física. Y estamos comentando antes la diferencia entre la mecánica cuántica y la relatividad general. La relatividad general es un ejemplo como Einstein como genio, 
descubrió, inventó una teoría que solamente 100 años después estamos comprobando en detalle. Mientras que el desarrollo de la mecánica cuántica uh, se hizo de manera totalmente diferente. Fue los experimentos en la radiación uh, de cuerpo negro, entonces las observaciones del efecto fotoeléctrico que convenció, uh, convenció a los físicos de aceptar el principio de la, la cuantización y los teóricos entonces siguieron después de los experimentos tratando de explicar los aspectos de los átomos, etc. Pues, como comenté, hay dos modos de hacer la, 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 la física y la física teórica. Uh, pensando en problemas muy básicas y, y permaneciendo uh, más cerca del experimento. Y dos, son dos estilos y los dos estilos uh, viviendo juntos. Bueno, pues yo quería hacer una pregunta también quizá un poco en una línea filosófica. Eh, ha habido un artículo reciente de Polchinski que se titula String Theory Comes to the Rescue. No, no sé si lo has visto, es de, me sí, parece sí, sí, que sí. es de, de diciembre. Y la tesis de Polchinski, al margen de hablar de las unidades de Planck, etc., pues es que eh, la teoría de cuerdas es esencial, dice, en la resolución de la gravedad cuántica, y que una y otra implican una cuestión que también es muy importante, que es que no hay una teoría física única, sino que hay muchas teorías físicas, y como él dice, son environmental, es decir, que dependen un poco del, del entorno. Esto eh, lo saca a colación también con la, el problema del landscape, y parece decir que, Teoría de cuerdas más eh, gravitación cuántica implica que las teorías físicas no hay una, sino que hay distintas y que eso además concluye que implica que debe haber multiversos. ¿Tienes algún comentario? Ya sé que es... Eh... Pues uh, todo eso me parece uh, bastante especulativo. ¿Bastante, perdón? Especulativo. Pero claro lo dice, que, lo afirma de una manera claro eh, que, tajante. Claro que la teoría de las cuerdas sigue en, en algún modo uh, la línea de Einstein de la relatividad uh, general. Y uh, hay gente como Polchinski que dicen que hay muchas posibilidades en la teoría de las cuerdas. Uh, 10 al poder 500 uh, vacíos Sí, 10 elevado a 500 sí, sí. Sí. El, 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 o más famoso, el famoso paisaje de la, las soluciones de la teoría de las cuerdas. Para mí es una conclusión uh, prematurada, porque no entendemos suficientemente la teoría de las cuerdas para decidir qué son soluciones válidas o no. Y en mi opinión es muy bueno especular, pero hay que tener en cuenta que no comprendemos suficientemente la teoría. Estoy de acuerdo. Bien, pues agradecemos una vez más al profesor John Ellis su magnífica charla.